I'm Brett Robbins. I'm the CEO and game director at Ascendant Studios. I want to start off by going all the way back to the formation of Ascendant Studios. Was the Mortals of Avium always the kind of game that you envisioned making as a studio's debut title? Yeah, I mean, I, I founded the studio really to make this game. Uh, I started thinking about the game a few years beforehand uh, while I was working on Call of Duty as a creative director. I had been just sort of bouncing ideas back and forth with uh, the person who would end up being my investor, uh, Brian, and, um, you know, got more and more excited about the idea and what it could become. Certainly the fact that I hadn't seen anything like this, like a magic shooter out in the in the world for many, many years was really compelling. I had a lot of ideas around the story and, and the world. Yeah, I mean, eventually we got to the point where we just felt like we needed to do this. So in 2018, I founded the company and at that point it was a company of one, just myself. And I went ahead and started building out a team. Immortals of Avium is being released as an EA original. So who approached who to work together on this? Did you approach EA or did EA give you a call one day and ask how you guys could collaborate? Uh, we approached EA. We had talked to them pretty early on after I formed the company, maybe in the first year or so. And I had, I had a very early demo that we had made and had shown them that. And then I think it was in, it was about mid 2020, we had given them a, a combat prototype that we're pretty excited about. You know, not a lot of the game had been made at that point, but we had, you know, the player abilities, uh, spells, some enemies stood up. Really just a, 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 what I thought was a good example of what the combat system could be and what the kind of core of the game could be. And they really, really liked that. Uh, they got really excited about that. And so that really got us talking about partnering together. And over the next you know, several months, we, we worked out how that was gonna happen. How did you come up with the idea of Immortals of Avium? Like, how did you how did you come up with the basic story and the idea to make it this magic-based FPS? I had a moment while I was working on Call of Duty where I had, you know, been reviewing one of the levels uh, that we had work, were working on, and it was a, a fairly standard Call of Duty level. It was a, uh, you know, a, a city street scene with lots of. Um, explosions going off, you're running down the street with your squad mates, there's helicopters flying overhead, there's you know, chaos everywhere, fairly standard stuff. I just remember stopping, I stopped and I thought, well, you know, instead of a helicopter, what if that was a dragon? Instead of a RPG shell going off and blowing up that building, what if that was a fireball? And what if instead of being a tier one soldier, I was a tier one battle mage? And, you know, this is kind of this image appeared to me and I just kind of stopped and I thought, man, you know, no one's making that game. Where's that? That was sort of a, a jumping off point. Now, what the game became, what Immortals of Avium is, is very different than just fantasy Call of Duty. It's its own thing. But that was, you know, sort of a, an, an early uh, inspiration. And then after I left uh, Sledgehammer Games, I had a period of about four months where I was able to just sit and write. And I just would go to a cafe here down the street near the office with my laptop. And I just, you know, started really thinking about what the world was gonna be, what the combat system was gonna be like, what the story was gonna be like, what the characters were. And out of that period of time, I had a, you know, I created a game design document and a story treatment and a vision document that really sort of set the tone for what we were going to do. And, uh, you know, five years later, if you looked at those documents and read them, you'd see that they were, you know, they're pretty close to what we ended up with, um, just in terms of what the vision should be. So you've emphasized that this is a single player adventure. And was there ever a temptation to make this a multiplayer game, especially given that so much of the story focuses on the Order of Immortals. We actually worked on a multiplayer mode for a while while we were doing uh, the game. The, the game was always gonna have a huge campaign to it and tell a big story. That, to me, was super important. It's the kind of work that I've done mostly in my career, you know, even on Call of Duty, I, I only worked really on single player, on games like Dead Space, I was a creative director on that. So I, I'm very comfortable and I, I really enjoy working on single player games. So I knew that was a large piece of it, but we wanted to explore other things as well. So we, we had prototyped a co-op mode that was uh, really compelling and really interesting. Um, you know, for reasons of time and budget, we decided that uh, we would uh, put it on ice and, uh, you know, just focus on the single player for a first release. But, um, 
there is a lot about this game that certainly lends itself to multiplayer, and I think that's something very interesting to explore in the future. Talk to me about Jack. What should players know about this character before going into this story? He's a character who starts with really humble origins. He's uh, basically, he grows up on the streets in a slum, an orphan. He has a small group of friends that, um, you know, are all sort of street thieves and just trying to survive. And over the course of the story, he, you know, through certain traumatic events, he finds himself innately imbued with a lot of magical power and ability. And this puts him on the radar of the immortals who are the battle, the, the best battle mages in this world. And so he begins his journey as a Magnus, which is what we call a, a wizard in our world, you know, fighting in uh, the Ever War, which is this huge you know, hundreds of year long conflict that's engulfed Avium. He becomes a battle, a battle mage, he becomes a Magnus, and eventually he becomes an immortal. You, you know, the campaign takes you through all those early years and, and his transformation as an immortal. And then ultimately a story unfolds where he's trying to stop the war. It's an epic story. It follows a huge, uh, you know, huge journey for him um, and a huge arc for his character. Uh, and he, of course, meets lots of other immortals and other interesting characters along the way. So I want to dive into this game's use of magic. Explain to me the differences between red, green, and blue magic. And are these like the only forms of magic in the world or are there other maybe un, maybe unknown sources of magic that are out there? Yeah, the three known sources of magic are blue magic, which is force magic, uh, red magic, which is chaos, and green magic, which is life. And um, all of Jack's spells, uh, everyone's spells, the, the spells of the Magni, utilize uh, one or more forms of that type of magic. Jack is special in that he is what's called a triarch. He's able to utilize and control all three colors of magic. Not all Magni can do that. Some only specialize in one or two colors. Because he can specialize and, and learn and use all three colors, uh, it gives him a lot of variety in, in his abilities. And yeah, each magic has sort of a different personality to it. You know, green magic has some healing abilities. Um, blue magic is much more forceful and impactful. Red magic is more uh, energy based. So, uh, you know, each spell sort of has its own personality depending on what color it is. What sorts of talents can players utilize with these magics? Like, tell me about the talents and the skill tree and everything that players are going to encounter. Yeah, we have a pretty deep talent tree and gear system, and the player can um, really customize their build and their play style with a combination of, you know, picking spells that you really um, are your favorites to use, finding gear that complement those spells, find, you know, buying talents that have um, that that also fit within your play style. Um, I think, you know, two different players can have very, very different approaches to combat depending on what kind of talents and, and gear they buy. Um, it's a big game, it's a long game, uh, so you have plenty of time to explore and to, uh, you know, try different abilities. The talent tree is broken up into, you know, the three colors, red, green, and blue. But there's also talents in there that are unique. You know, if you've purchased certain talents in, like, say, the blue category, it unlocks just different talents in like the green category. So there's a lot of crossover there. We really just wanted to create a lot of variety. We wanted to create a system where people could, you know, try different things, have a lot of fun expo you know, exploring, finding all the different talents and spells and figuring out how, you know, what they wanted to use, what their favorites were. You could certainly replay the game and choose a completely different path and it would feel like a very different experience. How much will players learn about the Ever War? Are they going to learn everything over the course of the game, or are parts of it going to be left intentionally vague for the sake of maybe potentially expand, expanding on this story down the line through maybe not necessarily a sequel, but also through, through other mediums? Yeah, you won't learn everything. We certainly have a tip of the iceberg sort of approach to writing where, you know, we will introduce concepts, we'll, you know, tease out certain things, uh, certain characters or events, uh, maybe not give you the full story. I mean, it's a huge world. We spent a lot of time on the backstory and on the mythology and on um, the lore, um, way more than we could possibly put into just the first game. Um, 
there's certainly a lot there that can be expanded on in future games, um, future media. We, we absolutely want to do all that. Uh, that's something that's very exciting to me. Um, but there's certainly enough there, you know, between, um, you know, just the, the storytelling through our cinematics, through our dialogue system, you know, in the game, you're able to you know, walk up and talk to characters and have dialogue options and, you know, learn more about them, more about the world. Um, through the lore um, that you can find, you can read, you know, read more about events of the world. Through all those different mechanisms, there is a lot to discover about Avium. Um, so I think people uh, will be able to really immerse themselves in it. Um, but we've, I think we've only scratched the surface as far as, you know, the stories we want to tell in this world. In terms of visuals and technology, what did Unreal Engine 5.1 open up to the team? What tools were available to you that maybe you didn't have in your past projects? Uh, 5.1 is really powerful. Um, the, you know, the, the graphics, the lighting, what they can do, what it does with um, objects using the Nanite system. It's pretty incredible. You know, it, it really just pushes things a little bit forward uh, in terms of how the game looks and how it plays. Um, I think, uh, you know, mostly the fact that you're able to light dynamically with lumens is, you know, just really both in terms of workflow and in terms of just the look really impressive, uh, really interesting. Uh, there, you know, there's been a lot of improvements on workflow and how the editor works and everything, you know, to me, it's just the next iteration. Uh, it certainly was nice. Like I came from working on a lot of proprietary engines, like working on Call of Duty and everything. It was nice to work on an engine that has a, such a huge community. So many people work on it. So many games and companies work with Unreal. It really opened us up to be able to, you know, just ask questions of a much, you know, larger group um, to, you know, figure out how to do things. Um, that was super, super useful about it too. And it's a very supportive community. Brett, the last time we spoke to you for Shack News was all the way back in 2021. Ascendant Studios was still in its infancy, and the interview was more of a retrospective of your career, in particular your work on Dead Space. At that time, we asked you what you thought of the teaser for the Dead Space remake that was at that time coming up. Now it's two years later and the game's out. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think of the Dead Space remake? I loved it. Uh, I played the hell out of it. I think I did three playthroughs. Um, it was a lot of fun. They did a great, great job on it. It looked beautiful. They, you know, replicated almost everything that I wanted to see them replicate in terms of the original game. And then everything they changed to me was additive. The, you know, the, the changes they made to zero G to, uh, you know, some combat and weapon design stuff, all that was like, it was, they're really, really smart choices. And those choices were always in the spirit, in my mind, of being true to the original. Um, I thought they just did a great job. Um, you know, I, I talked to their creative director, Roman, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, after the game came out and it was just a lot of fun to kind of trade stories about how, you know, how things, how, how you make that game, how you can go about making that game. Um, I did tell them that, you know, they could have saved themselves some time and given me a call and I would have been happy to, uh, to, to fill them in on stuff because they did a lot of reverse engineering just by playing the game. But, um, but no, they, they hats off to them. They did a great job. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it you know, it's a thrill to see a version of your work come out 14 years later and have it still be really enjoyed by people. That's, that's a great feeling. Mm -hmm.